Whenever people talk about balancing Overwatch, you'll almost always see them eventually devolve into an argument about who even gets to have an opinion on the topic between top ranked players versus the general player base. And honestly, it's always been an argument that annoyed me, and I've wanted to make a video about it for a while, but I couldn't really figure out what my angle was going to be. Thankfully, while I was in the midst of some really shitty writer's block trying to work on my next video, I stumbled upon this absolutely incredible tweet from Awkward, and I immediately found the angle I wanted to take on the topic. I have never seen someone so successfully sum up why this argument is dumb, and it's coming from someone who thinks he's somehow made the exact opposite argument. Like, I don't know what made you think you were cooking, dude, but you weren't even in the fucking kitchen. Like, you're fully ordering DoorDash to the wrong address. That's how far off you were with this argument. But Awkward, if you're watching this, thank you in advance for helping me prove why you're wrong. I'm assuming you'll write off any criticism as me being part of the hating minority while you're, like, the Overwatch equivalent of Oprah not complaining about patriarchy or whatever you were trying to say here, but maybe if you stick around you'll learn something. If you're watching this but you're not awkward, cheers! Your life is better for it. This video will hopefully help you avoid making a really dumb argument like he did. We're going to be using this tweet to dive into this idea that high rank means you should get to dictate game balance, why it shouldn't be taken seriously, and what actually should determine who gets to have a say in game balance. Part 1. Whose opinion matters? The line I really want to talk about, the best line of the tweet, is if you don't have a driver's license, you shouldn't be giving input on how to design a car. Because it's just... amazing. It's such a perfect distillation of why this argument is so bad, and he thinks it's proving his point. So, let's get into why this argument sucks with the most obvious flaw in this analogy. Having a driver's license doesn't mean you understand how to build a car. There's no component of a driver's licensing system that I've ever seen that includes getting a bachelor's of engineering. Well, you don't even need to know what an internal combustion engine is so long as you can do a proper hill park. We don't really have super high standards for getting a driver's license in large part because many of us live in places where a car is effectively a necessity, so the licensing system has to be as small as impediment as possible to getting behind the wheel while still maintaining some baseline expectations about your ability. That could be a whole separate tangent in and of itself, but for now it's important to recognize that a driver's license not only isn't a relevant credential when it comes to engineering, it also doesn't mean that the people who all have them are all good at driving. A driver's license just means the government thinks you're a competent enough driver that you probably won't kill anyone, not that you're actually genuinely good at it. In the Overwatch context, this analogy has a few issues. The first is that, obviously, hitting top 500 doesn't magically grant you a degree in game design. That actually isn't how anything works if you were curious, and being good at playing a game doesn't automatically mean that you know what's best for it. Like, if you're applying for a job as a game developer for Overwatch, do you think that putting that you've been a GM DPS for the last five seasons on your resume is going to help you get the job? Being good at a game obviously means you understand it to some extent, I'm not saying it doesn't. But there is a colossal difference between understanding how to play a game versus how to build the game. There's no meaningful overlap between your ability to click heads with Widowmaker and your ability to correctly assess how much damage it should do when you click heads, or what her range should be, or how long it should take to charge a shot, or how much health she should have, or how big your enemy's head hitboxes should be, or any of the countless other factors that play into this over any other player. And again, to be clear, that doesn't mean you won't have usable feedback as a high-ranked player, but it does not come from being a high rank. It comes from playing a ton of the game, meaning you have more experience with it in our more capable of forming a comprehensive feel for the game and whether something feels off. And even then, it's a big leap from being able to identify that a problem exists and being able to identify the specific nature of the problem, let alone a solution for it. However, again, that isn't inherently tied to rank. There are plenty of people who understand this game back to front, top to bottom, because they have spent thousands of hours playing, watching, and even commentating on Overwatch games, despite not being the highest ranked players. For example, according to some old Reddit posts I was able to find, Monty was in silver back when he was casting, and Golden Boy was in gold. And yet they were still fine casters. So he has been absolutely beloved by the Overwatch community for years, rightfully so, and is a top tier caster. But does anybody know her rank? Does it matter? Frankly, I'd trust her opinion on the game's balance over just about anyone in the top 500 because she had to really study and learn how the game works to be able to offer the insights that she did, and if it turned out that she was ranked plat, it wouldn't change anything about that. Meanwhile, Awkward's out here thinking he's about to blow your mind with the revelation that damage dealers dealing more damage is an indicator that your team is likely to win. Like, come on, dude. If you're gonna argue that being high-ranked means you're an authority on this and others aren't, it doesn't really help your case when you keep showing your ass like this. The second issue with this analogy is pretty simple. Overwatch doesn't hand out your rank by evaluating you in a standardized test, then giving you the same rank as everyone else who passed it, and then never really evaluating you again. There is nothing on your license that'll indicate whether you got a perfect score or just barely passed. A license is a license. When it comes to your driver's license, you also aren't really penalized for failing, at least not in terms of, like, having a worse license. You can take it as many times as you need to if you can afford it, and so long as you eventually pass, you're considered equally competent to everybody else on the road. Frankly, this is closer to Overwatch's win 5 competitive games challenge that it redoes every season. It doesn't matter how many you lose, as long as you eventually win those 5, you still complete the challenge. 
The third issue with Awkward's analogy is that it doesn't take into account anything other than rank. There's no requirement to play solo or with a group of people, and if with a group, what size, how many, how consistently. Or play a certain amount of the game, play a certain variety of heroes, play a certain number of hours across all roles, nothing like that. If you're metal rank, regardless of any other conditions, you should be ignored. And if you're diamond or higher, your opinion matters. And frankly, if you pushed him, he'd probably move the goalpost and say that diamond isn't good enough either, you have to be masters. And then if someone in masters challenged him on that, he'd change it to GM. It also doesn't take into account anything external to Overwatch. What happens if you're someone who'd be masters on 30 ping, but you live somewhere where you can't get lower than 120 ping? What happens if you're stuck playing on an absolute fucking potato of a PC that can barely hit 30 frames per second? On top of that, everyone and their mother has spent the last year complaining about rank inflation in Overwatch. How can you possibly hold that belief while also believing that rank is an objective measure of your qualifications to talk about game design of all things? Whenever this argument happens, though, there's always a follow-up along the lines of it's necessary to balance the game for the top level because balancing for the average player creates bad balance. And I want to get into that too. Part 2. Pedestrians and Casuals Continuing Awkward's awkward analogy, the idea that cars should only be designed by people who drive them is stupid, because it assumes that the only people affected by the car are the people driving them. The problem here is that everyone is affected by a car's design, not just the person driving it. In a reply, Awkward compared anyone playing quick play to someone in the passenger seat, which is just an extremely funny reply because it doesn't make any sense on any level. Like, are you saying that quick players are just logging into the game to spectate high-level competitive matches? A passenger, and I'll say this slow because apparently this is something that really needs to be hammered home, is someone who is not in control of the vehicle they're in, and goes wherever the driver decides to go. That doesn't describe somebody playing quick play, it describes a Twitch chatter. Somebody playing quick play is just somebody else on the road, in their own car driving to their own destination. Beyond that, car design, or at least good car design, i.e. not the Tesla Cybertruck, is done with pedestrians and other non-drivers in mind. There's a reason why cars crumple, why they dent easily, especially on parts like the hood. The idea is that you want them to have some give, so that 1. They don't transfer the energy of any impact directly into the people in the car, and 2. They don't instantly kill anyone they hit. If you were to hit an adult in the crosswalk and they, you know, get kneecapped, they fall under the hood of your car, you actually don't want them to get splattered like a bug when you're going 5 kilometers an hour. Ideally, when their head hits the hood, the hood will dent and absorb some of the impact so that all the kinetic energy doesn't go to work directly rattling their skull. A well-designed car isn't just built to handle impacts with other cars or pedestrians, but also inanimate objects. Like, okay, if a Cybertruck is in a head-on collision with a truck that wasn't designed by a moron with a fetish for stainless steel and wasting money, the other truck would still crumple and absorb the kinetic energy in a way that makes the impact less deadly on both parties, even if the Cybertruck itself doesn't do that. However, if the Cybertruck hits a brick wall, there is nothing on the other side of that collision that's built to crumple. Something's gonna have to give, and it is going to be the people inside the Cybertruck. A vehicle needs to be designed to accommodate the world it's in because a car is exists in the world and in tandem with other things. I don't know why this needs to be explained to people, but apparently it does. The analogy also assumes that anyone who is qualified to drive a car will drive a car, and, you know, through the analogy, that anyone who's good enough at Overwatch to be higher ranked than Platt will be as a consequence. But is that true? Is that an assumption we should be making here? There are plenty of reasons why someone who's capable of driving, well, maybe they're even an engineer who designs cars, might not have a driver's license. Maybe they walk to work. Maybe they take public transit. Maybe they prefer being driven by somebody else. Maybe they've watched too many crumple tests and they're permanently scarred. They just can't get behind the wheel of a car because they've seen what those cars do to people when they hit something at 60 miles an hour. Does that make them less capable of designing the car? Likewise, there are undoubtedly people who are extremely good at Overwatch who rarely, if ever, play comp for any number of reasons. Competitive is toxic, it's stressful, and the better you are at it, the more likely you are to be forced to play a specific meta, and maybe you just don't want to. In fact, maybe the reason they don't play competitive is directly related to an insight they have about why the game isn't well balanced, and so they've stopped playing it. Hell, maybe they're really good at the game when a certain meta is viable, but now that it isn't, they've fallen hard back into lower ranks. Does that mean they don't understand balance? What about the opposite? What about somebody who's low-ranked but would hypothetically be high-ranked if a balance change came out that suited their playstyle? What happens if your main's constantly in and out of the meta, leading to a fluctuating rank? Now, like I said earlier, everyone's driving on the road, everyone's in a car, quick play isn't a passenger, whatever. But you might counter that there are people who drive competitively, and that's exactly what I want to talk about next. See, those cars are specifically designed for competitive use. They might be a drift car, or a Formula One car, or a next-gen NASCAR car, or whatever else. But they aren't built for dropping the kids off at school. They're not built for handling sleet on the highway, they're not built with backup cameras so you don't back into a kid on a bike, they're not built for hauling shit, they're built for competition. And you might say, See, if you let normal people design those cars, they'd be poorly built for competition. And again, you're not making the argument you think you're making, assuming you're making the argument that I think you're making. When you're driving in an everyday streetcar, you need engineers to make sure it's safe, make sure it's efficient, make sure it's able to hit the speeds it needs to hit, and do all the other things a car is supposed to do. Now, if you wanted to design a car for a competitive racing environment, you think you would need 
less engineering expertise or more? Like, yeah, competitive drivers would obviously still have insight into this, but you don't let them build the fucking cards. You let them relay their issues to an engineer who can try and address the issue. And if the professionals say it doesn't work like that, you're acting like a clown if you say, um, actually, I think the solution is to have only three wheels, and I'm the one driving in the Las Vegas Grand Prix, so I think I know what I'm talking about. I hope by this point you understand why it's a really, really stupid argument to say that high competitive rank inherently qualifies you to talk about balance like you have any sort of education in the field of game design. However, that leaves us with a pretty major question for our next section. Part 3. Who should be listened to? Uh, spoiler, the answer isn't awkward. Or anyone like him. If you believe that competitive rank is a reflection of somebody's understanding of game design in any direction, you shouldn't actually be trusted with the game's balance because you clearly have no idea what's going on here when it comes to balancing a game. However, that's just somebody who shouldn't be listened to. Who should be listened to? Well, to be perfectly clear, I'm under no delusions that I should be the one leading the charge on balance here either. There's actually a reason why my videos aren't me confidently talking out of my ass to Twitch chat about how I think the game should be balanced and then sending it off to an editor to try and make it into a coherent argument. I am not a game designer. Not that it really matters, but the last time I played ranked, I was Diamond 1 on my main role of DPS and Diamond 2 on support. My weakest role was Tank, where I think I was Plat 1. I should probably have checked before writing the script, but I couldn't be bothered because rank doesn't really matter to me that much. I guess you could argue that I'm part of the metal ranks that shouldn't be listened to because of my tank rank, but again, it doesn't actually matter. My rank isn't the reason why I shouldn't be the authority on balance, it's the fact that I have no fucking education in this field, either in terms of a formal education, or just, you know, informally studying the game in a meaningful way in terms of balance. I am not an authority on this subject. Hell, even in areas where I am talking about things that are specifically within my area of expertise, I am still not THE authority. I'm also not saying you have to be an authority on something to have an opinion on it. Just like I'm sure you do, I have opinions about balance issues that I wish would be addressed, but I'm also very aware that there's a difference between having an opinion, specifically my uninformed opinion, and having an expert opinion. One of the biggest differences between video games and real-world competitions is that we can't really do different rules for different levels of play because that's not how we play video games. Hockey has different penalties at different levels of play. For example, body contact is a penalty at low levels, but at higher levels, for both amateurs and professionals, body contact is allowed. Video games aren't like that because there's no real way to do that without creating just a ton of confusion. If you're playing minor hockey and you're like under the age of 10, you're not doing body contact, and that rule isn't going to suddenly change on you. But with video games, your rank might fluctuate enough that the rules would change if the rules were different in Plat versus in Diamond versus in Masters. Video games just don't work that way. There's no way to do it without creating confusion. If you ban certain heroes in certain ranks or change cooldowns or damage or anything else based on whether someone was in Gold or Silver or Diamond, it would just be confusing for everyone. A game like Overwatch has to be balanced with everyone in mind, at least to some extent. And to be clear, this is not a bad thing. Different perspectives allow us to see the full picture more clearly. A gold player who's well-educated on game design might notice the ways that a playstyle that's common in their ranks could come to dominate higher ranks if a specific hero was buffed too much, and a top 500 player might never have thought of it that way because they never encounter that hero in that or any other context. A caster or coach who doesn't play the game as much as they watch and analyze it might notice something that the players don't because they're seeing the game in an entirely different way. An Overwatch League player or a Contenders player, rest in peace to the leagues, might notice a balance issue that has zero bearing on the regular game because no part of ladder is going to feature high-skilled pre-made 5 stacks exclusively playing against other high-skilled pre-made 5 stacks, especially not on LAN like Overwatch League games would be, and vice versa. The reality is that everyone can have an opinion about this stuff. I'm not saying they can't, but we shouldn't be using rank as the metric by which we determine whether someone's opinion is good or correct, or even the idea that there is an inherently correct opinion. Two people can have fundamentally opposed arguments that cannot coexist that are still correct depending on what outcome they're trying to reach. If you believe that snipers are inherently bad for the game's health and that nerfing them is a good thing, then a nerf to Widowmaker is the correct opinion for you. But if you think that strong snipers are necessary for rewarding high skill players, then you believe the opposite and you're still right. I can't stress this enough, it's important to recognize neither of those people are wrong. They have different ideas about what the game should be, and those opinions are both correct provided their idea of the game is correct. The problem, then, is determining which idea of the game is correct, and that's a problem that doesn't have an objective answer. It's part of why this discussion should not be led by content creators in general. Getting a lot of views, subscribers, and AdSense dollars is not actually the same thing as getting a degree in game design, but people with massive audiences are often deferred to over people with expertise because people think that having a big platform means you must know what you're talking about. Frankly, when it comes to Overwatch content creators, the best argument that Awkward is making is for wholesale refusing to let anyone with a fucking YouTube channel dictate balance. The people we should be listening to here are the people who have actually learned what they're talking about. Not just people who can tell you how to play the game well, but people who've spent time, effort, and usually at least a little bit of money to educate themselves in both formal and informal contexts on how game design works. That doesn't mean that anyone with a bachelor's degree in a related field should be uncritically listened to either. We still need people with a diversity of opinions, perspectives, and game design philosophies at the table to work through this stuff, and we need those people to be people who actually know what they're talking about. 
That includes high-level players, but it does not exclusively include high-level players. Because, say it with me, hitting GM doesn't mean you understand balance. Anyways, that's where we're going to end this one. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and if you feel so inclined, you should consider becoming a channel member. Channel members pay $5 a month to vote for one of the topics that I cover each month, with the December winner being a video about why good data isn't enough that'll hopefully be coming out next week. Next month's vote starts on January 1st with these two returning topics, alongside three brand new ones that'll be revealed closer to the start of voting. Also, come hang out with me on stream at twitch.tv slash If you're watching this on the day it comes out, I'll be live playing Overwatch over there starting at about 6pm Mountain Time. Thank you to all my channel members. MiniQ, Olesp, Cage the Orc, Fish Toast, Alex Stone, Nima the Survivor, Destiny, Connor, Yoshi of the Wire, It's Peggy BTW, Cat Lover 192, Sourdough, Illuma Riley, Monkey 12 Ninja, Cadence, V, and DeLeathers. Whether you're a channel member, a subscriber, or just somebody who clicked on this video out of curiosity, thank you very much for watching, and I hope I'll see you around again soon.